So just say no, hashtag no, um, the alternative path to enterprise agility. How many of you saw this headline? I think it was published on Thursday of last week. It, it did the rounds on social media. Right? Yeah, a, a number of you in the audience. This is, uh, I think, the key quote from it. More than half of, uh, this is from the UK. It's a UK survey of CIOs. More than half of CIOs think the Agile methodology is now discredited, while three quarters aren't prepared to defend it as a way of completing projects anymore. Additionally, half of CIOs think Agile processes are just an IT fad. And I think that this is copy edited because when I talk to these people, head of the PMO at a big British bank, for example, he says to me, it's a cult, it's some weird religion, and it feels awkward in our culture. Agile is failing. Now, the reason that we're here, the reason I got started down this path is that trying to scale Agile in big companies like Sprint and Motorola was failing for me even before we called it Agile. When I tried to scale it to the size of a business unit at Sprint in 2000, it was struggling. In 2002 at Motorola, it was struggling. When you brute force people to do it, it works for a while at a small scale, maybe a department level. But if you want hundreds or thousands of people to do it, it has to become the new way that they work, the new way they think. And the whole business has to embrace it. And that just hasn't been working. The URL's there if you want to read the whole article. It's heavily critical of the Scaled Agile framework. Uh, and to some extent, uh, the, the Scaled Scrum thing, the, the, the less thing. So, in 2002, while I was writing my first book called Agile Management, I started looking for an alternative. I realized I was writing the wrong book, solving the wrong problem, but I had a contract with the publisher, so I finished the book and it got published. And that was a good thing for me. Influential people liked that book. I got invited to places I would never dream of getting invited to. I've given talks for Barry Boehm at USC, I've lectured to his MSc students for him. And all of that came because I got an email one day that said, David, I've read your book and I think it's good. Unfortunately, it was the wrong book solving the wrong problem. And in 2003, I started thinking about what the right answer was and that emerged into Kanban. So back then we started 2004, Microsoft's IT department doing software maintenance on internal applications like their payroll system and their HR system. But now we know that Kanban works for all professional services. Last year at three of our conferences, we had people from advertising agencies. We now get people from law firms, from market research companies. Anyone in the audience here who would admit to not being in the IT industry? Actually, a surprisingly large number of you. So it's not just for software development. It's not just for your IT department. And it's really the least disruptive approach to enterprise agility that I believe that we know of today. But perhaps unsurprisingly, because there isn't a huge number of you here, it's the most radical alternative to Agile, and the Agile movement doesn't like it, and they haven't liked it for a decade. Why is it so radical? Well, there's no revolutionary change. We don't come along and say, oh, you dinosaurs doing the waterfall method, you need to replace that with our new method. We don't do that. We start with what you do now. No estimates. Once upon a time, developers hated doing estimates until it became a tribal ritual. Now they don't like taking it away. No iterations. No time box batch transfers. No planning. 
Now, this is where we were at in 2005. By the time I started evangelizing this a little more, 2007, March of 2008, I gave a, a keynote speech at the QCon uh, conference in London. And in the front row, there was a collection of the UK's agile luminaries. Some of you will know these people. Rachel Davies, uh, Dan North, Steve Freeman, there was a few others. And at the end, Rachel came up to me and she said, this is going to scare the living daylights out of the agile community. No planning, no iterations, no estimates. And we weren't finished. No prioritization. No backlog grooming. I didn't even imagine we'd need to create a no backlog grooming. But we weren't backlog grooming in 2005 and we're not doing it today. If you're backlog grooming, you're wasting your time. Backlog grooming is waste. Prioritization is waste. Planning is waste. Iterations are just awkward and estimations are waste. Agile is incredibly wasteful. And then no dependency management. And no cross-functional teams. And now we have the agenda for today's keynote. This is going to scare the living daylights out of the Agile community. Right? I was standing on a stage, Rachel was in front of me. Rachel was one of the very first people through the Kanban coaching masterclass in 2009. It's a little reminder of what we did at Microsoft 2005 along with Dragos Dimitriou. 230% productivity improvement, 91% reduction in the lead time from 0 to 98% on-time performance improvement. It took 15 months and it cost almost nothing. Nowadays, you're told that if you spend millions and millions on some large-scale, agile thing, you might get 50% productivity improvement. Well, was that repeatable? Well, the following year, two middle managers at Hewlett Packard called Sterling Mortensen and Brett Dodds revolutionized how their laser printer division works. Right? They took... Uh, a Kanban, uh, as part of a lean initiative, they produced 700% productivity improvement, dropped the lead time for new firmware on printers from 21 months to three and a half months, and four and a half day a week working. Took them less than a year, and it cost them nothing. No coaches, no training, no consultants. They literally sat in the audience like you are today and listened to a talk that I gave and went home and implemented it. If you want to see the video of that, Lean Kanban 2009. In China, three companies have very large implementations, and uh, Adam Wu is here. Adam, where are you? He's a KCP with a white lanyard. He's been involved in these. Huawei, big telecom company, more than 5,000 people. This year, they're scaling to 98,000 people. They're already producing between 10 and 50% productivity improvement with what we call Proto Kanban. At 5,000 people, that's 1,250 engineers they didn't have to hire. And it cost them almost nothing. Ping An's a huge insurance and banking company with aspirations to be the next HSBC, and they've got 5,000 plus people, and CMB is China Merchants Bank, more than 3,000 people doing Kanban, and these implementations have cost almost nothing. The return on investment on these Chinese implementations is in the region of 30,000 to 40,000 percent. Compared to the money they're spending on implementing Kanban, just on staff savings alone, they're getting three to 400 times more in investment. Kanban's cheaper to implement, cheaper to implement than Agile methods. One of the companies I just mentioned, and they prefer that I don't mention them specifically with this statistic, has been running a side-by-side -side comparison because they're a nice CMMI level four organization. They know how to do this. Where they're implementing Scrum, they need one 
Agile Coach for every 12 to 14 employees and it's not institutionalizing. As soon as they take the coaches away, it falls apart. They have to put the coaches back. Kanban for three and a half thousand people cost them 200 days of training and coaching from Adam and his colleague Kim Yen. It's institutionalized across five different locations, five cities in China. So much so that the CIO has toured around. They spent a lot of money making a video. And if you were here at last year's event, you saw that video. Meanwhile, 12 years later, we're not hearing massive failure stories. Yes, there are failed Kanban implementations, often because they didn't follow the advice that people are given in the Kanban coaching masterclass. They failed to install or the other type of failure is they do Kanban that helps them a bit and then they just stop. That it, it just levels out and it doesn't get better. But compare that with the stories of 20 to 40% staff turnover in some large scale transitions. How many of you in the last 10 years have worked at a company where people were quitting because you were running some brutal large scale agile transition? I'm sure that many of you are not admitting it because I know that here in DC, in fact, within a range that we could throw a stone, there are several companies that have gone through brutal transitions that have cost them a lot of, of staff turnover. So has Agile been too tribal for too long? Is it more about being Agile, being one of the club? rather than helping your business, your organization, improve its agility. So just how radical is Kanban? Now, I've got a lot of slides here. I'm not going to teach them. They're really there so that I can just highlight what we do instead, instead of the nose. If you want to understand these things, find someone with a white lanyard later on and ask them to explain it to you. And if they can't, you're welcome to report back to me, <laughs> just to put these guys on the spot. No revolutionary change, right? Traditional change is this idea that was invented by McKinsey, that you start by analyzing the current process, and then you say, well, that's obviously wrong. We need this different future process, and that's either defined or designed. Ideally designed because it's more consulting money. If you just take it from a textbook, then you don't make as much money. And then we run a transition, a project, to switch you from the old way to the new way. Well, this is how it feels if you think about capability or performance. When you start these transitions, it gets worse. Sometimes the trough can be very deep. And it takes a while to get out of there. And if the trough, trough's too deep, the change agent gets fired. And what does the company do? They reorganize as a misdirection to hide the fact and they blame the guy that they fire in the reorganization and then they do it again. Jim Collins book, How the Mighty Fall, that, that's the pattern. Or if it takes too long, they run out of patience. They don't recover back to where they were or, or improve. And once again, the change agent gets fired and they reorganize as a misdirection, and they do it all again. And I know that within two or three miles of this location, there are multiple large American companies who have now done this three or four times with Agile. The Kanban methods that start with what you do now, gain agreement to pursue improvement through evolutionary change, and encourage acts of leadership at all levels. We don't cast some value opinion on what you're doing now. We just accept what it is, and we help you to get better, regardless of how good or bad the starting position is. Right. Now, evolutionary change is a bit different. It means you take your current process and you mutate, you mutate it a bit. You mutate it because it wasn't fit for purpose. And then you evaluate whether it's a bit better and you keep doing it. Now these changes can be small enough that you can roll them back. They're safe to fail. 
which is probably why we're not getting the, the, the we're, we're seeing the no harm thing. We're not getting these huge stories of Kanban inflicted massive pain on our organization. You don't see those stories anywhere. But you see plenty of them about agile implementations, particularly large scale. And sometimes you can't roll something back. Usually it's a bigger change. Imagine that you spend $2 billion building a new corporate campus. You, sent, you, you closed 27 offices around Kansas City and moved all the people into the new location. You don't roll that one back too easily. Uh, so you have to just keep rolling forward. The point here is there is no end point. There is no point where the consultants can send their invoice and say, we're done, you are now agile. Instead, with Kanban, we install seven different feedback mechanisms to help the mutation, the evolutionary change work. These are known as the Kanban cadences. And then you get this kind of thing. Your fitness, your capability, your performance rises in lots of small J's. And as you get good at it, the size of the J's can get bigger because you're growing your change management capability. We saw this already in 2007. This is not new news. And then we understand the evolutionary theory, the concept of punctuated equilibrium. In punctuation points, it's easy to insert change. Financial crisis, regulatory changes, political changes, merger, acquisition, divestiture, some split in the company like the divorce of HP. IPO, outsourcing, CEO change, key man exit, reorganization. Reorganization is usually the misdirection to allow you to insert more change, but it's brutal. You lose a lot of institutional memory when you reorganize. Arrival of a disruptive innovation or insurgence in your market. And it's easy to insert change because you get 100 days to blame the old way that you were doing things. During periods of equilibrium, that's much harder. I spend three days of a five-day training class teaching coaches how to deal with this. You need an emotional motivation for change, immersive experiential learning. People need to feel the pain before they're ready to make changes. And then you introduce the new species in the environment and you leave the old one there to compete with it. If you introduce replenishment meetings and you select into a Kanban system essentially based on cost of delay, you don't even tell people that. You just say, pick the thing you want next for delivery 30 days from now. They suddenly start thinking in a cost of delay mode. And then if you're lucky, six weeks later, they realize their old method of prioritization is no longer required. They've obviated it and it drops out of the environment. The gray squirrel displaces the red squirrel if it's fitter for the environment. You may need to isolate things to help that. That's known as the Galapagos Island effect in a book from Tim Harford. It's also known as, as the innovator's solution in the book by Clayton Christensen. Then we've got no estimates. This is the thing that Kanban was famous for in the beginning. So do you manage your business based on speculation, superstition, socially engineered heroics, squeezes based on commitment, or do you use facts, objectivity, science to make decisions? Most people would say that they do the second thing, but if you walk into their organization, they're doing the first. There is a cognitive dissonance about this stuff. Meanwhile, by studying the real world, the environment around us, the natural philosophy of the business environment, we've come to understand that things take a certain amount of time and we can understand that probabilistically. That lead times through Kanban systems follow this Weibull style distribution and about maybe 10% of cases it's a log normal distribution. As a little hat tip to Todd Little who is in the front here who's been pushing the log normal for 15, 20 years already, Todd. <laughs> so, if you understand that, you can set expectations of how long something will take. And, that's too fast. 
we can have a service level capability, what we observe, a service level expectation, what the customer would like, and a service level agreement, what you've actually agreed in the hope that you can achieve it. And we can use this sort of information to make rudimentary forecasts that actually work pretty well using something called Little's Law, but it's not Todd Little's Law. And we know this works now. We understand the mathematics of it. We understand the principles behind it. And we know that as long as you have what we refer to as a super exponential Weibull distribution or a Gaussian distribution, so something that, that has this kind of shape like I showed you or more of a bell curve, as long as that's true for the lead time, the rest of this equation works. We've got Andreas Bartel in the audience. He has data sets that are not like that from uh, the, the lottery company in Germany that he works for. And therefore, you can't use this. You know, you're a very long tail in your distribution. And this doesn't work. Enterprise services planning re requires two forecasting methods, reference class forecasting and Monte Carlo simulation, if you want to get really good at this stuff. Now, reference class forecasting is the thing for which Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize. It's basically a method of saying we're going to look at the recent past and we're going to figure out how far back in the recent past we can go. And we're going to say that the near future will reflect the conditions of the recent past. Therefore, we can take the data from the recent past and use it to forecast the future. This stuff is not rocket science. And we now know how to do this very intelligently. We can study things like the top graph here is the transaction volume, the number of pool transactions in your Kanban system on a daily basis. The middle graph is the, the rate of change in those transactions, known as the volatility. And the bottom graph is the volatility of the volatility, known as the turbulence. You can only use reference class forecasting if you don't have turbulence. So the right hand set of data there is from Raymond Keating's department at the 9X from 2013. And clearly turbulence free, Raymond is running a nice smooth flow system and he can do good forecasting. The one in the middle is his neighbor's department, very turbulent. Basically any kind of mathematical probabilistic forecasting is denied to them. If they were doing it, they're just kidding themselves on. They do not have what Edwards Deming would have referred to as a stable system. The data on the left is from the Swift Kanban development team, and it's very illustrative of what we call a volatility regime and a change in that regime. And we now know we can do this mathematically. We can sample enough into the past and say, here was an inflection point. Something changed back then, so we're not going to sample the data any further. And this makes the forecasting very accurate. Now, you can take data like that. And this is a scope forecast. You can see this demoed on the Swift Kanban software. You type in scope like I want 10 user stories and three system enhancements and five bug fixes. And then it simulates how long that's going to take. And then if you have some rough idea of what it's worth, it will multiply the two together and give you the probable cost of delay in starting. Ask for a demo of it. No iterations. Right. Most businesses don't lend themselves naturally to starting work and completing it um, with synchronized time boxes. In fact, in my opinion, as a software developer since the early 1980s, the whole thing of doing things in time box batches is for low maturity, low capability organizations. Organizations that don't know how to do configuration management because they're afraid that something will escape into the wild because they can't control their configurations. Or they're doing it because they don't trust their people and they need to hold their feet to the fire with some short time frame commitment. And then, what if we want to be more agile? Well, let's start with a one-month time batch. Oh, that's too long. Let's have two weeks. 
maybe we can get down to one week. Last year, I was giving a keynote at an internal event at a British bank. And to open the conference, one of the senior executives called in remotely to, to give a small pep talk. And he congratulated everyone on how great they were at becoming agile. And some of the departments had got to one week releases and some were doing two weeks. And this was wonderful. And then he told them that his ambition was to have daily releases in future. This was a gift for me. I walked onto the stage and I said, so you guys are a big scrum shop, right? And they're all nodding. I said, okay, you heard the big boss. He wants da daily releases. Who fancies doing one-day sprints? Right. In the extreme, this stuff breaks. Time boxes will not get you where you need to be. Oh, and if you're an advertising agency, why would you do stuff in time boxes anyway? Your clients are going to go to a different advertising agency because you're not fit for purpose. They don't want to work in time boxes. Uh, that stuff's all documented in the tyranny of the ever-decreasing time box, and the URL is there. So we separate out these, the, the cadence. We get rid of the time boxes. We have a separate replenishment cadence. And the more frequently we can do replenishment, the more frequently we can meet with business owners and choose things, the greater our agility. And if we could do it on demand, every time there's a free slot, that's as, uh, the, the greatest agility you're going to achieve. We actually had this at Microsoft in 2005. And then, how often should we deliver? Well, that depends on the transaction cost of taking the delivery and the coordination cost of doing it. It's often a different set of people who are involved. Why would you couple choosing stuff to delivering stuff? Decoupling them is the natural way of things for most businesses. And the more frequently we can do it, the greater our agility. And in software, there's a lot of technology to help you with this now. It's pretty easy to do frequent deliveries. The customers don't always like it. They don't want to have to learn a new version every few days. And then there's the idea that we can defer the commitment on delivery. Why make the delivery commitment when you, just, when you make the selection? Yes, we want to do that, but why commit to some specific delivery date when you've got some probabilistic chance of hitting it and the tail on that distribution is five to 10 times greater than the average. Instead, wait. Wait until it's closer to the time and then say, these are the things we're gonna promise for next week's release. And we can forecast this stuff. Forecast ahead to what might make it in the release and we could have 100% confidence in these and maybe 70 plus percent in these. What if we now re-simulated that by changing the class of service to fixed delivery date? So now we have 100% confidence in this particular batch. Huawei built this themselves, running on top of Swift Kanban, so that they can do this at an enterprise scale. No planning. The key here is, that you don't plan the work, you plan the ecosystem that will deliver the work. You plan the design of your Kanban system to meet the demands and the ebb and flow, the variability that you see. And you do that across a whole network. That's enterprise services planning. It's not about planning individual work orders, it's about planning an ecosystem that will deliver within your customer expectations hopefully all of the time. And if you don't get it right with the first go, you keep evolving it. You let the Kanban cadences do their work. And after perhaps 12 to 15 months, you've got an entire business unit that delivers within expectations all of the time that's fit for purpose, that has evolved to be optimized for its environment. The key to this is to learn to see services, to look around your existing organization and see things as services rather than as matrix managed, whatever, whatever. 
You don't have to change it, just learn to see it differently. All right, and then once you see a service, once you can identify a service, you can Kanban that service. And doing that is very simple. You use the training in our basic training, the KSD Kanban system design class, the static method, and you implement a Kanban system. You treat each of them separately. So at a relatively low maturity but high scale, you get lots of individual Kanban systems around your organization. And they're locally optimizing, they're improving locally. Now that's not, not the final solution, obviously, but it's a lot better than where you were. The static method we teach in class, and it comes as a set of workshops. And I know people like Eric Green have run a lot of those workshops um, in some clients in this neighborhood. Many of you in the class, in the room here have probably sat through static workshop exercises with Eric over the last couple of years. And pretty much anyone with a white lanyard here can help you with this stuff. This is codified. Then we have these really simple scaling principles. There's no scaled Kanban framework. The way you scale Kanban is you do more of it. You can buy in each service, it's a service-oriented approach. And if you know anything about service-oriented architecture and software, you understand it's a flat structure. It doesn't suffer from scale problems. You use static and you install the Kanban cadences. Kanban management professional, the second two-day training class. Two two-day training classes and you ought to be able to implement Kanban at oh, six, seven hundred people scale and make it work within a year very effectively and double, treble the productivity of that business unit on what did it cost you? Almost nothing. Less than the cost of a single employee. You join the dots together with the cadences. You let the ecosystem evolve on its own. It takes some leadership to make this work. Middle managers have to stand up and be accountable. It's not going to work if there isn't leadership. It doesn't need the chief executive to mandate it and tell people they'll be fired if they don't do it. But it does need some middle manager to be willing to pay for an operations review every month. Then we'll talk more about this when I get to know dependency management, but reserving capacity and the use of dynamic reservation systems is the way that you resolve more exotic high risk elements that cascade through the network of Kanban systems. No prioritization. What does priority even mean? Most companies bandy this word around, this is high priority. What does that mean? Does it mean it's position in a queue, that it's at the front of the queue? Does it mean it's, a, it's class of service, the way that you're going to treat it? If it's a high class of service, maybe it gets to jump the queue. Maybe it gets to be in a separate queue that gets served faster. Or is it just an indication of when to schedule an item? If it's high priority, we have to schedule it soon. And actually, rather than have ambiguity, we'd rather just call those things out. What's its class of service? When should we schedule it? And in what sequence should it be done? There are three separate problems. And if you mask them into its high priority, then somewhere else in the organization, some poor souls having a meeting deciding which of the several hundred high priority items should we not do because we don't have the capacity or capability to get them done and they have no further information other than it's high priority. All right, so don't prioritize, select dynamically. When someone walks up to a Kanban board because they've just finished something and they want to pull the next item, they select dynamically from the items in, in the done column that's upstream from them. It's dynamic selection, not prioritization. You're deferring 
the selection until the last possible moment. How many of you sit in prioritization meetings here? How many of you sit in reprioritization meetings? <laughs> prioritization is wasteful. Priorities change. Don't do it. Defer. Select the item at the last possible moment. Right, make the cost of delay transparent, visualize the risks, enable the dynamic selection, empower people to make good decisions. And we do that by visualizing risks in a risk assessment framework. These things are known as caveat charts or caveat diagrams. And creating risk profiles. And if you want to see this working in software, go to the Swift Kanban booth. And then, you know, we could have a chart that might, uh, we might try to organize this framework so that things to the outside should be done first and things to the inside should be done later. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if it looked like this? You compare three different things. Oh, obviously we do the, the, the blue one first. Doesn't really look like that in real life. Here's a real one. Any bizarre voice guys here today? Maybe not. They're from Austin. Um, so th this is a real one from Bizarre Voice, ratings and reviews engine that's used in, in websites. And uh, we've got, the, the story here is that the pale blue one is the chief executive's hot new idea. But we don't have capacity to do it, and we're currently doing these other three, the green one, the red one, and the purple one. Now, a picture like this is actually communicating the business value Business value is not a number that you can put in a column in a spreadsheet. It's some very complex, dynamic picture that involves many different aspects. We all intuitively know this. So, if the blue one is good, which one of the other three should we not do? You, can, you don't need to understand their business to look at this picture and think, oh, that looks like it's going to be an awkward meeting. And yet, pictures like this get these things resolved in about 20 minutes, and everyone walks away with a consensus. Ivan Font, who's here, Ivan somewhere, where's your, Ivan, um, he, he now lives in Cancun, lucky Ivan. But he used to be in Barcelona at a travel company called Adigio, which is Europe's competitor with Expedia. And he'll be able to tell you a famous story of how a well-known consulting firm wanted to do some things and the internal staff shot it down in a meeting with the chief executive using this technique because they were able to show the chief executive that the other things they were already doing were more important and more valuable. Everyone left the meeting with consensus. And why was this important? Because the chief executive is an ex-consultant from the same company. Right. He had to break loyalty with his own former colleagues in order to do the right thing for his new business. And this made it transparent and obvious. Now, we saw this thing earlier, the forecast of the scope and the lead time forecast that's done with Monte Carlo. If you have some understanding of the cost of delay, which is this cost function at the top here, you can multiply these things together, and what you get is the probable cost of delay in starting. And this helps you understand when to schedule something. When does it start to get really painful? And the point here is it gets really painful when the slope gets really steep. This is real software. You can see this on the Swift Kanban booth. No backlog grooming. The Kanban way is leave your backlog ungroomed. So, how many of you book air tickets online with like Expedia, Travelocity, some, pretty much everyone in the room? You ever do one of the searches and it comes back and it says there are three and a half thousand flights that match your criteria? How do you narrow down three and a half thousand flights to choose just the one that you're actually going to book? Do you prioritize the three and a half thousand flights? How long would that take you? How do websites like Expedia or eDreams, which is Odigio's website, how do they work? They work by filtering. You filter on different risk criteria. 
So you filter on things like how many stops on the flight, how long's the total duration, what's the departure time, what's the arrival time, because these could be risks for you. You might be giving a speech at 9 o'clock in the morning and therefore arrival time is a pretty critical risk you need to manage. And then once you've done a whole bunch of filtering, you can sort things like show me highest to lowest price and so on. But you only do that after you've narrowed the thing down. Leave your backlogs ungroomed. Make selections by filtering. And how do we do that? Well, you create a risk assessment framework for a Kanban board or maybe an individual work item type. And when a new item arrives, Somebody, maybe the business owner, fills in the risk assessment. And the way we teach this is that the categories in these risk dimensions are all factual. They're facts, they're not speculation. And therefore, the big benefit is facts don't change very often. You don't have to groom things which are facts. You just leave them in the backlog and you filter them. So... The way you do this is you create a demand shaping threshold. Any of you do triage in your companies? Triage for bug fixing maybe, a few of you. So if you know about triage, you understand the principle that we want to sort things into the bugs we're going to fix now, the bugs we will fix later, and the bugs we will not fix. And to make those decisions and to put things in the three buckets, you use criteria like What's the impact of the bug? How many users does it affect? How badly does it affect the way the software works? These are all risk dimensions. And if you've got a sophisticated triage mechanism like Microsoft, then you use terms like the bug bar. And the bug bar is basically the policy criteria for the thresholds on each dimension. How many users need to be affected before we decide to fix this bug immediately? And as you get closer to a release of a product, the bug bar tends to raise. You only fix the very critical ones. So if you were using this technique for bugs, critical bugs are ones that have big profiles towards the outside of the picture. And less critical ones have small profiles in the middle. So if we set the bug bar here, the demand shaping threshold, if something plots to the outside, we're definitely going to do it. If it plots to the inside, we're not going to do it. And if it's, it straddles the threshold, then we have to talk about it. So the way this works at really large scale, this is a screenshot from the Swift Kanban software, and they may have updated this a bit since I took this picture. But what's going on here is that the backlog is here. So this is all the user stories in the backlog. Now, obviously, it scrolls off the bottom of the screen. And we have our risk assessment framework here, which will have been coded in for this Kanban board at some earlier time. And the pictures here are the risk profiles for individual user stories in their backlog. Now, you could do this at the story level. You could do it at the epic level. You could do it at features. It could be different work item types for different industries. But imagine you've got 3,500 of them. Then you set the demand shaping threshold up here. And what it does down here is it stack ranks everything into, in this case, we have six dimensions. So six out of six to the outside, five out of six, four out of six. Now imagine you've got capacity in a release for maybe two or 300 user stories. Say it's 300. Well, you, you scan down the six out of sixes. And if that's less than 300, say it was 200, then you get to the five out of sixes, maybe there's 70 of them, you're at 270. Then you get to the four out of sixes, and there's 60 of those. And that spans across your 270 to 330. You've only got capacity for 300. All you have to do now is pick 30 from that set of 60. The first 270 are in, and the rest are out. So the ones we're definitely going to do, the ones we're going to talk about, and the ones we're not going to do. You can cut an agile planning meeting from potentially days to about 20 minutes, and everyone leaves the room with a consensus. You do not need to groom your backlog. 
Backlog grooming is just busy work. No dependency management. So if you have some even rudimentary qualitative understanding of the cost of delay, and you have an understanding of lead time probability distributions, then you have a good idea whether it's early enough that there's no risk to an item being delivered. And your historical data will already have dependency delays built into it. So if you can start something early enough, you don't even need to ask the question, is there a dependency here? Because even if there is, you've got enough time. It's only when you don't have enough time that that begins to become a problem. When the cost of delay is greater, you need to introduce slightly more sophisticated methods. And again, the real world outside of software development solved this problem a long time ago. They're called reservation systems. And we started to see these emerge. Really, the first one I ever saw was Janice's implementation at Posit Science in San Francisco in 2009. But they didn't conceive of it as a schedule like this as weeks. It was more of a queue. The first one that actually looked like this was Sami Honkinen, one of his clients in Finland in 2011. And you see the, the URL with the reference there. And then the next place I found it, surprise, surprise, was eDreams in Barcelona, a travel company. But the big surprise was, who was it that implemented the scheduling system? Their finance department. The Kanban in the finance department had one of these before anyone else adopted it. Then when I saw it, I, I highlighted it back to them, and their airline ticket solutions department implemented it. And if you want to see that case study, it's from the videos of Lean Kanban Central Europe from last year, and I'm sure Wolfgang uh, Wiedenroth can help you with the URL for that if you need. Wolfgang's over here somewhere at the back. Um, so the idea is that you've got your network of essentially cascading service nodes. And you're interested in knowing if we start something up here, will it cause a dependency down here? And will that dependency cause a delay? Because we don't have so much time. We need to pay attention to that. And therefore, we might do stuff like we might reserve, whoops, we might reserve capacity down here for demand that comes from this source. That capacity allocation has been a well-known technique in Kanban for a long time. And we might uh, uh, introduce the reservation system and be able to make reservations if we can predict a dependency. So if we know we don't have enough time, do a little bit of analysis. Figure out whether you think there's a dependency, and if there is, make a booking. Make sure the capacity is there, and add that to your definition of done. Oh, sorry, your definition of ready. Right? You don't start something unless you know you've got the booking. And depending on the urgency, depending on how bad the, the cost of delay is, you gradually add more elements. And what we're doing here is we're introducing different classes of service for reservations. This is a bit more exotic, but has anyone ever had a standby airline ticket? A few of you. You get the idea then, right? Standby is a different class of service for whether you get on the plane, where whether you have economy class or first class is the class of service once you're on the plane. Now, recently I tweeted that class of service is to the Kanban coach what the sonic screwdriver is to Doctor Who. Right? It is the weapon to attack virtually all problems. Right? If you're a Kanban coach and you find yourself being called to the dark side, the dark side is determinism. It's just give me an estimate. It's let's Cartesian, let's break everything down into atoms and estimate how heavy they are. If you feel that call to the dark side, then the use the force message in your head should be class of service. It's the sonic screwdriver of Kanban coaching. 
And therefore, I had to slap myself when I figured this out. You use class of service for reservations, and you only do it when you need to. So the default is no dependency management. Manage dependencies only when you need to. And there's a whole set of class material on this in the enterprise services planning. Um, Odigio eDreams in Barcelona now have a fairly large implementation of this, and the chief executive has actually asked them to implement it across the whole company. So when we get to Lean Kanban Central Europe in November in Hamburg, I'm very much hoping that they will have a case study of doing this stuff at uh, sort of 1,800 people scale. Right. They're already doing it in a non-trivial business unit, which is their airline ticket uh, retailing unit. And of course, you can have multiple reservations with different classes of service for the same item because you're not maybe sure exactly which week the dependency is going to hit. To get this sophisticated, you might need to do it with software. Um, the... Uh, Many of the early implementations of this stuff were just done with physical boards. Very cheap. And finally, no cross-functional teams. I did this to be provocative, although some of you will know my article on Kanban does not share your agile cross-functional team agenda. But what I really mean here is no reorgs. The start with what you do now method isn't the Let's reorganize your business unit and start there method. It's the start with what you do now method. One of my clients was a very big uh, Central European bank, and I was in their Russian uh, subsidiary headquarters in Moscow a few years ago. And my sponsor there was uh, the CIO and the COO. And they had created an entirely shared services organization in IT. But they were getting a lot of politicking from a bunch of guys in their PMO who were mostly consultants from Germany. And their argument was that the shared services model was not working and that they should change everything into a matrix managed organization and basically give all those PMO guys their own little empires. To which my reply was, so shared services are not working because they're unpredictable and things take too long. And they were like, yeah, all right, let's just fix that problem. Another example, very big global credit card company's office in London. And I was dealing with a vice president there who ran a 700-person software development org, and they had another 700-person sort of IT services org. And he said to me, there's been a whole stream of consultants in here telling me that what we need to do is DevOps. That if we have DevOps, then it will stop the problems we have with our IT services not being fast enough. And I said, okay. And uh, what's the problem with that? He said, well... Two 700-person organizations mashed into one, two vice presidents, only one remains. Right? Which one is he? I said to him, okay, so your IT services are unpredictable and things take too long. Why don't we just fix that problem? You can ban an IT group and the devs aren't going to have any complaints anymore. You're going to have fit-for-purpose IT services. Don't reorganize. It's brutal and painful. Right. There is a, another a credit card bank that might not be far from here. And they've got reorganization like it's an addiction. Right. And the, the, the people nodding their heads in the room are those people who've been reorganized probably twice this year already. Right. Nobody likes that. How do you get a decent review from your boss when they've only known you for three weeks? Right? So don't reorganize. Start with what you do now. Face the problems you're facing. You know, if you reorganize, you're just hiding them. You're not fixing the problems, you're just hiding them. You're changing one problem for another often, trading off one for another. 
Right, so learn to see the services and fix them, right? We've seen these slides before. Kanban each of the services. The skill is to see the services. And anyone with a white lanyard in here can teach you how to do that if you're not confident about it for yourself. Kanban improves what's known as Einheit in uh, mission orders or Auftrags tactique. Some of you will have seen Chet Richards, who's been a keynote at several of our conferences over the years. Einheit is a German word meaning unity and alignment. And when people understand who the customer is, why they want something, and what the risks associated with it are, you can get large separate organizations of people all working together like one big team. The reason I use the word team in the Kanban book is because everyone in the Kanban system is aligned against a common goal. It doesn't mean they're in the same organizational unit. Kanban facilitates geographical distribution. So the article I started this talk with, something like half of the CIOs said, the reason Agile's not working for us is we can't reorganize to have cross-functional co-located teams. Hmm. The very first Kanban at Microsoft was in Redmond, Washington, and in Hyderabad in India. We were doing distributed enterprise agility in 2005 at one of the world's largest tech companies. And if you want to get a little more sophisticated, we have this uh, improving labor uh, pool liquidity, staff liquidity pattern where you have some dedicated teams for different work items or different services on a Kanban board and then you have perhaps a complementary number of workers who can be moved around, who are flexible. So you have the team lead, the service delivery manager role. You have some junior person, some apprentice who gets rotated around the different, the different services. And then you have your generalist or T-shaped people who have avatars on the board and they can float around and move. And this improves your chances of matching a piece of work to a worker. Now, the way you do this, for the last eight years, we, we had sponsorship at this event from Ultimate Software. And when they did this, they talked about we're putting the departments back together. Four years earlier, some Agile consultants came and said, break your departments up into small Agile teams. And then when they started doing Kanban, they put those departments back together, like 36 people. And some of them were dedicated to different work item types, and the others were the floating workers, the generalist T-shaped people. So I'm aware that we're, we're out of time here, and we're just wrapping up now, before Janice panics too much. All right, so Kanban and enterprise services planning it's been the alternative path to enterprise agility for the last 12 years. It works for all professional services. You can do it in your ad agency. You can do it in your market research department. You can do it in the finance department, the HR department. Companies like Audigio are Kanbanning the whole company. It's not just for software and it's not just for your IT department. It really is enterprise agility. It's not IT department, big scale, agile. It's the whole enterprise. It's the least disruptive approach to enterprise agility. Start with what you do now and add things incrementally. But it's the most radical alternative to agile for the eight reasons that I've given you in this talk. Right. No revolutionary change, no estimates, no iterations, no planning, no prioritization, no backlog grooming, no dependency management, no cross-functional teams. Learn to just say no to all this agile tribal behavior. Right. This is still scaring the living daylights out of the agile community nine years later. But it's not about no voodoo rituals, right? This isn't some anti-agile campaign that I'm on. It's actually about helping real people be successful at their real jobs and making their businesses more effective.
It's about caring about the real problem. If something is disruptive, painful, time-consuming, and yields little information, so if you feel, if people are complaining, we keep getting interrupted to do estimates, we keep having to reprioritize things. We do these three-day dependency management planning things in a great big room with hundreds of people, and then we discover that we didn't get it right. If something is painful and expensive, think about stop doing it. And only add it back in small quantities when the risks require it. You can get rid of 95% of all this waste. And finally, no prescriptive process definitions. There is no agile, it's, there is no Kanban methodology. Find your own path to agility. Thank you very much.